School. And uh, we start with Phil Bloom from uh, CERN and the uh, Weizmann Institute. And they will lecture on physics of the early universe. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? No. No. Not at all. Not at all. Now? This is just for recording or it should also amplify? Okay. One, one. It's getting better and better. Giovanni, should I? I can start without and uh, raise my voice a bit. And say all the bad words. Okay, you hear me now? All right, so um, it's, great, uh, it's great to be here. I've heard a lot about this place. Thanks uh, the organizers for um, giving me the opportunity to speak here. And it's good to see you, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming too, I know some of you guys. Um, and I've been given the task to, um, um, to talk about a beautiful topic, so physics of the early universe as it was called. Um, one thing that I really like about it is that it doesn't have the word uh, model, for instance, in it, even though, of course, it will contain a model. But it's really the physics of the early universe, that's the way at least I chose to interpret it, which means we have an object to study, it's the universe, and we have a huge array of observational information about this physical object. And we can begin to dissect it and study it and analyze it and understand the physics of it. And it's also a rather important subject to understand. Okay. Does this work? All right. Thanks. OK. And uh, so these lectures will be essentially on the blackboard. I'm just going to use a few slides um, where there is, um, I would say, striking observational data that I want to guide us um, in the discussion. And it's going to be rather informal. You should feel completely free to stop me with questions at any point. Um, so we can 
understand what we're talking about here. Okay, so physics of the early universe. Oops. And what I want to start with is the state of the universe. And I'll actually start with the universe as we see it essentially today, and then we're going to work our way backwards from that. But when I say today, I will also mean on very, very large distance scale. So this is what we do when we discuss cosmology, or at least in a major part of our time, we're discussing physics on very, very large scales. And on very large scales, or in very early times, as you will see, the universe is characterized, or the state of the universe is characterized by, I would say, three main observational properties, okay? So the first one is that the universe on very large scales seems to be approximately homogeneous. The second one is that it seems to be very isotropic. And the third one that we'll talk about a lot is that it is not in a steady state or in a static state, it is expanding, it is moving all the time, it is changing. And I would like to discuss each of these three observational um, points about the state of the universe now, and then we'll understand more quantitatively some of their implications. Okay, so let's analyze them one by one. So what do we mean by homogeneous? Okay. And this is, in fact, one of the properties that are, at least locally, the hardest to infer observationally about our universe. But you can get a rough idea of the situation when you look at plots like this. So this is um, the picture of the telescope that has performed the so-called Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This telescope is monitoring faraway galaxies. And it's producing pictures like this one, where we are in the center of this picture, and we're looking at the distribution of galaxies far away in the universe, okay? And the dots here are essentially concentrations of galaxies. Each of these galaxies has hundreds of billions or even trillions of stars in it, okay? Stars like our sun, and each point here is, is essentially a galaxy, or we see the concentrations of galaxies, and we are walking out in distance, far away into the universe, and this distance is characterized by a label that they are calling here redshift z, and we'll discuss more how this redshift z label relates to distance, but we're really going out far away in space, and the distances we're going out on in this map, uh, redshift of order point 0.1, which means that the distance is of order half a gigaparsec out on this map, roughly. A gigaparsec, for those of you who are more familiar with particle physics terminology, so a gigaparsec is roughly 3 billion light years. Okay? Oh, giga light years. <laughs> Okay, so three billion light years away, this is roughly the scale at which we're looking at this map, and the statement of homogeneity, which is really not that trivial to see from this map, this map doesn't look very homogeneous, the statement of homogeneity is that if you would divide this map into large chunks of order a few hundreds of megaparsec across, okay, across this map, then roughly the distribution of these galaxies in each chunk is roughly similar. Now, it's really not very easy to see by eye, and in fact, by eye, it looks like there are deviations of order unity from homogeneity on this map. The thing is that homogeneity is really, really difficult to measure from the special point we're at, or the non, from the, our point of view, I would say, because to measure homogeneity, we have to somehow characterize fairly each of these points, each of these galaxies, which includes understanding its luminosity or its mass, its intrinsic property, because we want the color scale here to represent something, something that sort of we can compare apples here to oranges here, so these are all galaxies, we want to compare them fairly, and we also need to measure the distance to them and between them accurately, and that is an extremely hard task observationally. Okay, but you can more or less see 
that the statistics of this distribution is resembling between, uh, between different patches on this map. Now, the further we go in maps like this, the more uniform, or the more homogeneous the distribution of this matter looks like to us. Okay? So, in fact, today we have surveys that are going much further out. So, this redshift label of 0.4 corresponds already to a distance of order a few gigaparsec. Okay? Uh, many um, billions of light years away from us. And this is where the previous picture fits in. It's this little patch in the center. And as we zoom backwards, the distribution begins to look more and more homogeneous across um, this distribution of galaxies, even though it's still not an obvious point. Okay? So why do we really say, or why do we really think that um, um, that there is evidence for homogeneity um, in the distribution of these galaxies. Well, first there are quantitative successes to the theory that I'll discuss here that makes the first approximation of treating this distribution, this gas of galaxies, as being approximately homogeneous. So a model, a homogeneous model, actually seems to describe the, dynamic of the dynamics of this gas rather well. We will discuss this model and its successes and failures. Okay, but the second point is related to the second property that I've mentioned before, which is isotropicity. Okay, so let's make the difference between homogeneity and isotropicity. So far, I've been talking about homogeneity, which is the statement that wherever you go in this universe, this gas of galaxies, and you look around you at any different point, you see more or less the same thing. You see the same number density of these galaxies around you, and they have similar properties. And they have non-trivial clustering, and the statistics of the clustering seems to be more or less the same here and here. And maybe, maybe we have some observational bias, but it's not very far from the statistical properties here as well. So this is homogeneity. Wherever you go in a slab of homogeneous matter, locally around you, you're seeing more or less, you're seeing the same thing. So that's the homogeneous limit. This connects to another property of this universe, which is called isotropicity. By isotropicity, I mean, okay, so if the homogeneity, homogeneity was the statement that wherever you wander in your spaceship around in this universe, you see the same thing, isotropicity means that as you stand in any point, let's say this point in this universe, and you look in some direction, and then in another direction, then whatever you see in one direction, you're going to see the same thing in the other direction. Okay, wherever you look, you see the same map. This is the statement of isotropicity. You can sort of imagine it here as well, right? So our survey was sitting in the center and looking in different directions on the sky. And more or less, if you look at a slice along each direction or a line of sight along each direction, yes? So the question was, why is there a blank patch in the survey. Well, the survey only covered part on the of the sky, okay? We still don't have a completely full coverage of the entire sky. Things are in our way. For instance, the disk of our galaxy. So that's actually, it's a very good um, uh, point to, to mention that locally, the state of the universe very locally, very near to us, is obviously far from this more or less homogeneous gas of galaxies or gas of particles, okay? Locally, if you look around you, you see it in a highly non-homogeneous room, right? If you move across different points in the room, you're going to encounter different things. Our galaxy is also a highly non-homogeneous object, so our galaxy, roughly speaking, has the structure of a thin pancake of stars with some bulge of stars inside, Okay, and the density, and there is some fluffy clouds of gas above it, okay? And the density, as you walk across our galaxy, you hit density, over, over densities of gas that are many orders of magnitude. Um, this corresponds to orders of magnitude variation between different points on the galaxy. Okay, so our, our galaxy definitely has some preferred shape, and also it has fluctuation, strong fluctuation in density. It has this very strong fluctuation in gas density across its thin disk. Okay, so it's a highly non-homogeneous 
object and it has a special shape, okay? It looks nothing like this more or less homogeneous gas of particles that we see when we look far, far apart at how many of these different galaxies fit together, okay? And the shape of our galaxy in particular, if you put a survey somewhere in the disk where we are, and you want to map up the sky by looking at light arriving in different directions of the sky, then in some directions, this galaxy is going to be just in your way, and it will block your survey. And this is one of the things that makes surveys like this so incredibly difficult observationally. Okay, so locally, our local vicinity is highly non-homogeneous. Even our local galaxy, on scales of um, tens of, or hundreds even, of kiloparsec, okay, um, so a small fraction of these scales are already non, are highly non-homogeneous locally. Okay, but far away, we see this uniform homogeneous gas. So I'm getting back to isotropicity. We said homogeneity is a property of matter in which wherever you walk inside of this slab of matter, you encounter the same properties, so the same physical conditions. Isotropicity is a property, is a, is a configuration which, in which wherever you look, you see the same thing. And we have a striking, as opposed to homogeneity, we have a very striking observational evidence for isotropicity of our universe, okay? And the observable is something that you've all heard about, I'm sure. And this is the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is a black body spectrum of photons, of light radiation, that is coming to us from all directions. So when we put out an antenna, a directional antenna, and we measure the flux of these cosmic microwave background photons, then wherever this antenna looks, it is the same flux and essentially the same spectrum of these black body photons. And we'll have much more to say about this later on. Okay, so I can show it in, the, in this uh, famous plot here. So the uppermost plot shows a map of our universe, this is, you should just think about it as an atlas, it's the four pi sphere, okay? Stretched in coordinates that are used to see in the atlas of the world, okay? So also in the atlas of the world, we need to stretch a sphere onto a sheet of paper, a planar sheet of paper. This is what we're doing here, it's just that the sphere that we're stretching on the paper is the four pi world we see outside of us and not the surface of the earth. Okay, so this is a map of the world, of the universe, as seen when we look outside, we put an antenna and we measure the flux of cosmic microwave background photons. And this map of the universe in CMB is absolutely the most boring map that anybody has ever been able to draw. And it's so boring because wherever we look, we see really the same flux of photons with the same spectral properties, the same black body spectrum. And wherever we look, the photons we, come can be, we see can be characterized by a temperature, a black body spectrum, can be characterized by a single number, which is just the temperature, or roughly the mean energy of the photons. And this temperature is 2.7 Kelvin wherever we look, okay? So this is precisely what an isotropic universe should look like to an observer. Now, this isotropicity is also not completely perfect. So homogeneity was obviously not perfect. Yeah, we had to zoom back to be able to say that the statistics of the distributions of the dots, of the distribution of the gas of galaxies, were resembling each other in different patches of the sky, but locally they were highly not homogeneous. So homogeneity was clearly an approximate, approximate property of the gas of galaxies. Isotropicity is also a, just an approximate property of this map, even though it's an excellent approximation, so let's quantify that. Well, if you measure the mean temperature, average temperature on this map, and you subtract the flux of photons corresponding to this aver average temperature, you can measure it very well and subtract this background, this uh, non-interesting map, what is revealed is not zero, which would be the case if uh, the map was completely isotropic, but there is some um, remaining radiation that we see on this map. And this remaining radiation has um, an effective temperature which is a thousand times smaller, 
Okay, so what remains when you subtract the isotropic part is a thousand times smaller in temperature than the background is. Okay, so in fact, that's the temperature variation here. So the flux is really smaller by a factor of a thousand. Okay, so there are features on this, uh, on this uh, residual. So the first feature, here you see these um, spots, traces a straight line more or less. That is just our galaxy, again, standing in our way as we're surveying the sky around us. Okay, so this, this notch, these spots are not evidence for break, breaking of isotropy of the universe. They are not because you could be swimming in a completely homogeneous and isotropic, for instance, pool of water, but you'd be wearing goggles with some dust on your goggles, okay? Or some something, um, uh, something, some, uh, something not clean in your goggles. And that would be just foreground. It would make the image look anisotropic. And this is essentially what you see in this line of little spots. It's dust on our goggles, okay? It is, in fact, coming from dust, but not on our goggles. So the remaining striking feature here, it has a dipole pattern. It has a blue spot here and a red spot here. And this corresponds exactly to a Doppler effect, okay? So even if I have a completely isotropic universe, even if indeed the flux of photons that come to me is uh, isotropic, is the same in all directions, but in this realization of the universe, I will go in a plane and fly across this um, realization of the universe, then photons coming ahead of me will be Doppler blue shifted by my motion. Photons coming behind of me will be stretched and red shifted by this motion. And this dipole form is exactly the form of such a Doppler effect. So this is what would happen if you have an isotropic map, but you travel in this map. Okay, so an isotropic map has a preferred coordinate system. It has a coordinate system at which the map is isotropic, but if you begin to move in this coordinate system, then your motion will break the isotropicity, okay? And this is the main part of this effect. Now, from this effect, we can measure the velocity at which we are moving in this isotropic frame, okay? And this velocity is about 370 kilometers per second. In other words, this dipole map can be subtracted by using a single number, well, three numbers if you count the direction as well. These three numbers are the vector velocity of us with respect to an isotropic frame. Once we subtract this velocity, what we're left with is again a very small residual, okay? And the residual that we get by subtracting this dipole is of the order here of 10 micro Kelvin. So one part in 10 to the five of the initial temperature of this map, okay? So, this was an artifact, the foreground on our Google, so it remains here, here's our galaxy right in your face. It's this, but we want to talk about the universe far, far away behind this, so we need to find a way to subtract it. And on the background, where we can look outside of our galaxy, we still see some residual violation of, I, of isotropy. We see these patches, and these are genuine primordial violations of the isotropy. Okay, so when we look in different places on the sky, we really see variations. Isotropy is really just an approximate property of the universe, but it's approximate, it's good to the level of one part in 10 to the five. So just to convey the picture of how good of an approximation isotropy is, or to give you sorts of an order of magnitude for that, imagine that these violations of isotropy, these patches here, would be the ripples on some swimming pool, okay? So let's say you have some swimming pool in your backyard, and you have little wavelets on the swimming pool of height of, say, 20 centimeters. And now we want to ask ourselves just how deep is the swimming pool if the relative height of these waves is one part in 10 to the five, compared to the total depth of this water, well, this swimming pool, if we want to make an analogy of these violations of isotropy, has to be 10 to the five times that, so it is 20 kilometers deep, okay? So for your ordinary little swimming pool, ordinary 20 centimeter wavelets would correspond to breaking of isotropy 
of our universe if the swimming pool is 20 kilometers deep. Okay? So isotropy is an excellent approximate property um, characteristic of our universe. And the thing with isotropy is that while it is easy to imagine a universe that is homogeneous but not isotropic, okay, can you imagine a realization of matter, which is distribution of matter, which is homogeneous but not isotropic? Do you have an idea? Anybody wants to try? Lattice. Yes, excellent. So, for example, as I said, our galaxies, our galaxy has a shape. It looks like a, a pancake or a disk. It definitely has angular momentum, which means that it has locally a preferred direction. So I could, for example, construct a gas of galaxies like that, which would be distributed isotropically. Okay, in fact, what was said here is lattice, but um, uh, uh, distributed uh, homogeneously, but all pointing in the same direction. That would be an example of breaking of isotropicity, but keeping homogeneity. And the lattice example, actually, what I guess you refer to is not preferred direction locally, but really just a lattice of these galaxies, equispaced with distance A in all directions, where if I zoom out far enough, um, I would see a homogeneous universe, but in fact, this kind of lattice may not be an accident example because this kind of lattice, if I can zoom out enough, it will also look um, rather isotropic to me. However, so the point is here that this lattice also has a preferred direction, which is, if you want, the lattice directions, and those, those can be probably inferred by an observer. Okay, so you will see that the local lattice directions are respected also far away. Okay, so, but we can work out many such examples. It's really easy to construct a universe that is homogeneous and not isotropic. But it is much, much harder to construct a universe that, it, that is isotropic, but not homogeneous, as long as we imagine that the isotropicity is not just the property of our little place in this universe, okay? Of this little place from which we look, everything looks isotropic to us. If isotropicity was also supposed to be a property of other observers in the universe, and you would think that any other observer in the universe could see the same thing as we do, otherwise we are at a very special situation here. So if other observers also see an isotropic universe, then you cannot really um, go out without having also homogeneity involved in it. Okay, so isotropicity to any observers implies homogeneity. So, in fact, the isotropicity is, is maybe our strongest evidence for homogeneity as long as we assume that our other observers see the universe the same way that we do. And this is just uh, some more details on how this foreground dust in the galaxy obscures our view of the CMB, cosmic microwave background, and a snapshot of the situation, the detail at which we are studying these maps today. Okay, I should better move on. So the third property of this universe, it is approximately homogeneous. It is very, to very good approximation, isotropic on large scales. But it has another property, which is that it is expanding. And what we're seeing in this map, okay, so as we go to that gas of galaxies, Remember our gas of galaxies from the previous picture. And we sit somewhere and look at all of these galaxies. And what this map is telling us, this plot is telling us, is that when observers look at those different galaxies, okay, and when these observers can measure the distance to the galaxy, then what we find is that the different galaxies are actually receding for us. Okay? All of these galaxies are receding for us, the galaxies on the previous uh, plot of the gas of galaxies, and they are receding for us in the unique homogeneous and isotropic way 
at which this kind of motion can happen. So the receding for us, satisfying the homogeneous and isotropic um, realization of expansion, which is the velocity that we are measuring for these galaxies, is proportional to some coefficient, let's call it h naught, times the distance to the galaxy. Okay, so when you think about it, you will realize that this kind of isotropic and homogeneous expansion law is the unique homogeneous and isotropic expansion law. Okay, so the velocity of recession has to be proportional to the distance between us and the galaxies that is escaping from us. And what this plot is doing is, is exactly realizing that relation, okay? So as a function of the distance to the galaxy, we can measure the velocity at which this galaxy is receding from us, and we find locally, close to us, um, a few hundred megaparsec from us, an essentially linear relation. So from this kind of linear relation, just looking at nearby galaxies receding from us, we can measure the slope. And this slope is roughly 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, okay? So at a distance of megaparsec, this um, global expansion is about 70 kilometers per second. We have to go to further distances than a megaparsec. We have to go to hundreds of megaparsec for this bulk motion, or for this global universe, um, homogeneous isotropic motion to show up above the little peculiar motion of the little galaxies uh, around each other. Okay, but when we walk far, though, far enough away, when we walk 100 megaparsec away or a gigaparsec away, we get to high velocities that stand out across the little variance, you see? So at any distance, I have a small variance, which is just peculiar motion of the little gas particles around each other. But when I walk far away, the velocity grows, and it becomes very evident. Okay, so these galaxies are receding from us. And the way, the easiest way to measure this recession is by the redshift, which in fact the observers use in the previous plot instead of the distance. And the redshift come, is coming from the fact that when the galaxy is receding from us in this way, light emitted from this galaxy is Doppler shifted so that its wavelength is changing according to just relativistic Doppler shift which would be h naught r over c if the distance of the galaxy from us is r. And this observer is called z. We will be back there in a minute. Okay, so in fact, we can trade locally when this expansion is characterized by this single number h naught. We can trade distance and redshift, and we can say that the distance is c over h naught times the redshift, or if I put the numbers, I like CGS units for these kinds of exercise. So I have three to the 10 centimeters per second. Let's take a redshift of 0.1, which is what we already know from the previous plot is roughly the scale of this picture. And this coefficient of the uniform recession that we found, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, so 70 kilometers per second is 70 times 10 to the 5 centimeters per second megaparsec. Okay, so distance is related to redshift, and the relation is that locally we have about half a gigaparsec for redshift of 0.1. And now, in plots like that, or the previous one, you can directly convert redshift to distance. But this is only part of the effect, which is, uh, explains the effect when we look at it locally. Locally means that we have just a single number, edge naught. Um, but when we go farther away on the map, this relation will break, and it will be the topic that I will discuss shortly. So also the expansion itself, if we went here and build a map of the expansion going out to about half a gigaparsec, 
we can make maps that extends much, much farther out. So when, when the map extends farther out, it becomes more convenient to, in fact, use the full relationship between distance and redshift. And what the observers have done here, don't worry about the precise conversion right now, they took the redshift all the way to one. If we would naively apply this relation here, we would get to distances of few gigaparsec away, okay? But it's a naive application at this point. And here, what we're plotting is the, essentially the log of the distance to the galaxy, okay? So we have, before we had velocity with respect to distance. Now we have, this is a proxy for distance, and this is a proxy to velocity, okay? So it's the same plot presented in a different way. The details are not crucial here. What's important in this plot is that the previous plot fits in this little sample of galaxies, local sample of galaxies here, all the way to redshift 0.1 or so. But we actually see this recession law goes out to much, much larger redshift of order one, okay? And what you need to take from here is that the black line going through the data is a model, a mathematical model describing this expansion, and it goes through the data very well, and this is the model that we want to understand, okay, or to explain here. So we understand this expansion, and this expansion actually continues, the galaxies continue to uniformly expand out, and it continues to high redshift or to very far away distances if we would naively expand this formula. I'm sorry? To which model? The line? Um, we will calculate this model, okay? So the line is, um, is the following model. If you know the contents of this universe, the matter content, radiation content, the center of the universe, then, and we, then with general relativity, you can calculate how this universe will behave. You can calculate the expansion. This line calculates the expansion based on a model for the contents of the universe and general relativity. Yes? So in this case, what the observers are using is for the redshift, they're using, for instance, spectral lines. We will discuss that, okay? So in fact, I will get there. But the, we have proxies for redshift. So redshift, um, as we defined it here, is the shift in the wavelength of light. And if you have some standard um, wavelength, for instance, some atomic emission line, then you can measure um, the observed wavelength of this emission line compared to what you know is the emitted, the standard emitted wavelength for this emission line. And from this, you can calculate the redshift if you have the lines from the galaxy, so you can get that. And to get the distance, in this case, you need to know the intrinsic luminosity of the object. Okay, but this is, so this would be a very good topic, for instance, for the Q&A session to discuss exactly how this plot is derived, okay? Okay, so this expansion actually lasts even farther back. This redshift of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of order one was distances of gigaparsecs away from us. When we go, yes? I'm sorry? Okay. So the, y, the question was, what is the y-axis here? I actually wrote it in the slides. The slide would become available. So the y-axis, what you should take of it, is the log of the distance to this object. Okay? So the, the exact uh, choice of coordinates for this measure or measure for this is not very important. It's just the log of the distance that we can measure somehow. So we know these are far away light bulbs. We think we know the total emission, the total luminosity or energy output of each light bulb. We think they are more or less similar. You can see that there is some spread around, um, around um, you know, the, the y-axis measured at, at a given x. Um, but we think they are more or less similar. So if we know the total luminosity of each light bulb, then putting it away at various distances, we can calculate how the flux that we will see will decay. Flux will decay like one over distance squared law with some modification that I can, I can go into the Q&A session if you want. But if, if you have uh, nominal light bulbs, you can get the distance by measuring the flux. This is what they do here, and they like to plot the log of that. You mean this spread around it? So, 
all, all, all I think I can reliably say about this question, quantitatively, I don't know the answer. What, is the, what sets the quantitative scale, this uh, 0.4 in log distance, okay? But um, it is a difficult measurement, okay? A, B, you can see that at any given point there is an intrinsic spread, which means that these light bulbs, f f some of this intrinsic spread is um, just observational problems, and some of it is probably related to the fact that the light bulbs are not really standard. They do have variations between each other. So, for example, these light bulbs are essentially type 1A supernova explosions, and those are not really standard. Observers really have to do some uh, gymnastics in order to relate this, um, uh, the luminosity of these um, explosions to the properties of the light curve of the emission from these, from these explosions. And this is difficult and has intrinsic spread, okay? So it's a difficult measurement, but you can clearly see a trend. And really, I don't mind at this point, um, you know, the exact small variations that could be compared to this expansion law. What I care is that we clearly understand the bulk of this effect, that's one. And second, this expansion law, this is really an expansion law. This line tells us that expansion continues even when we look really far away in space, okay? Distances of gigaparsec. So when we look far away in space, as you know, the light takes longer and longer time to get to us. And so at some point, after some distance, it becomes more useful to think about time instead of distance. So how long was it when this light was emitted? or how old was the universe when this light was emitted. And the expansion, actually, we can extend the plots that we saw before, and we can even look at earlier times in the age of the universe, or even farther away in space. And just occasionally, the universe turns, out, turns uh, on for us some spectacular, spectacularly strong light bulb. These are called quasars, which are galaxies where the center of the galaxy outshines the trillions of stars that are hosted in, the, in this galaxy. So something, somebody or something turns on an insanely powerful uh, light bulb that outshines everything around it and can be seen to humongous distances. And these objects have been alive ever since the universe was of order one billion years old. We will get there, but the oldest object that we see today around us, if we look at globular cluster stars, at old stars, in the Milky Way and in other galaxies, we see stars that are about 14 or 13 billion years old, okay? And we don't see objects that are older than that as of now. The oldest object, the oldest system that we see is about 13 or 14 billion years old, okay? Now, these quasars are so far back that the time gap between them and us is of the order of 10 billion years. They have been shining there when the, um, the universe, or the, the universe as we know it, that is building these stars, was about a billion years old. And the light coming from these quasars is absorbed in little blobs of gas on the way. So the universe has these galaxies on the way. Galaxies carry with them um, a diffuse cloud of hydrogen, of gas. And these diffuse clouds of gas absorb light on the way, so light from the light bulb is being absorbed, and it's being absorbed resonantly with some atomic, specific atomic lines, notably the Lyman alpha line, okay? So what you're seeing here is a function of wavelength. You're seeing the spectrum of light coming from this faraway powerful light bulb, and the little lines here are absorption lines. So where there is a line that's going down, we are not seeing the photons coming from the light bulb. It's being absorbed resonantly absorbed in some specific atomic line, okay? So this curve is what we think is the continuum light emission from this quasar, the light bulb. Here we measure it, the continuum. Here we think it exists, but really it's absorbed so powerfully that we can't see it directly. And from these property we can, properties, we can infer two things. First, this system is extremely old. It's been shining ever since the universe was about a, one billion years old. And second, expansion that we can measure from the properties of these absorption lines has been going on already at the time. Okay, so expansion has been, is dating back a very long time. And there are more arguments that expansion dates back even further. 
out. Okay, so from the CMB itself, I don't want to dwell too much on this because I'd like to go into quantitative analysis, but I'll have to mention something about this. So what you see here is the spectrum, the famous Bell spectrum as a function of wavelength or frequency up here of the CMB photons. This axis is in gigahertz, so the peak is at around 150 gigahertz. That's a microwave emission. And this is this map that is almost uniform on the sky besides from contamination from our own galaxy on the way. And wherever we look, as I said, we see the same spectrum. Now, this by itself is powerful evidence for expansion dating back a very long time. And to appreciate it, I wanted to think a little bit on how you've been told in class, okay, in undergrad that people create black body spectra in the lab. How do we make a black body spectrum? Well, the family, it's, it's been called black body. The idea is that you put a light bulb, okay, or a light source, and you put it in a cavity, okay? Closed cavity. How to make a Planck spectrum. Spectrum. Well, you take this cavity and you put a light source somewhere in between and you make it opaque to light so, or reflective inside so that photons that are emitted from the source are scattered many, many times from the walls of this cavity. Okay? And you can put a little hole in there so that eventually radiation can escape. And when you measure the spectrum of radiation escaping from this hole, it has the black body spectrum. And that is a result of the fact that each little photon scatters or is being absorbed and emitted again multiple times in this cavity. To get a good black body spectrum, you have to have the photon scatter many, many times inside of this cavity. So that is how you make an approximate black body spectrum in the lab. Well, it's natural to ask, how does the universe make its own black body spectrum, which is more perfect than any black body spectrum that we have made in the lab? Well, it should better have the photons scatter around and bounce around and thermalize. The black body spectrum, its property is that it is the maximum entropy distribution of energies for the photons, okay? It's the state where um, uh, the system of photons advances to and eventually saturates at after many, many scatterings. So the universe should have many, many scatterings for the photons to get to that state. But we can ask how many scatterings does a CMB photon have? Photon have. Okay? Well, let's consider all of this enormous universe that we're looking at. I'll do it in here. So, we have a universe with an age the age of the oldest stars that we see is in the ballpark of 10 giga years. So we can ask how many scatterings does a CMB photon have across this time? Well, these scatterings of the photons, scattering of the photons happens on ambient electrons in the universe. This is the useful scatter for us to scatter electrons onto. And to know how many scatterings there are, we need to know what is the density of scatterers. Well, locally, the density of these electrons is Ne, which is about 2 times 10 to the minus 7 electrons per centimeter cubed. It's a fantastically good vacuum on average, our universe. But it does contain this diffused gas of electrons, okay, roaming around in between the galaxies that you've seen. And in fact, today, all of these electrons are ionized. They're in ionized states. They are not bunched up in neutral hydrogen. So they are really maximally effective in scattering these photons. And now we know the density. We know the age of the system. We can calculate how many scatterings a photon have over the age of the system. So this, is, this quantity is usually called tau or from optical depth. But it's really how many scatterings we have. So the total distance 
that our photon does over the edge of the universe is c times the edge of the universe. Well, this is the speed of light. And this total distance divided by the mean free path for scattering, for a single scattering, will count for us the number of collisions like that that we have. Now, the mean free path is 1 over the cross-section for scattering, which is the Thompson cross-section for this electron photon scattering, times the density of scatterers. So the optical depth is C times H universe times Thompson cross-section times the electron number density. And with the currently observed properties of the universe, we can put all the numbers in here. So this Thompson cross-section is 8 pi over 3 alpha squared over me squared coming from this diagram. Okay. And its value is about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 25 centimeters squared. So we have everything we need. This is 3 times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. We have an age of 10 giga year. So 10 giga year is 10 to the 10, and one year is 3 times 10 to the 7 seconds. So this is 10 giga year in second, and this is C. Times are 6.6, .6, 10 to the minus 25. Times are 2 times 10 to the minus 7. One part in centimeter cubed. Okay? So this is the dimensionless number, and you can plug the numbers in here, and the optical depth that you get from these numbers is of order 10 to the minus 3. Okay? So I have a minus, a whomping minus 25. This 10 to the 7s cancels each other. This is a 10 to the 20, giving me a total of minus 5. And all the other one numbers conspire to give me about 100. So I have 10 to the minus 3. So our CMB photons actually are doing something that seems to be completely different from what we're used to for a black body cavity. We are definitely not today, we are definitely not living inside of a black body cavity. Nevertheless, we see a black body spectrum of photons. Okay? Even though each of the photons today in our universe just goes across this gas of galaxies, without ever interacting even once. Expansion will solve this for us. The way that expansion will solve this for us is that when we have done this estimate of how many collisions we will have over the age of the universe, we have considered the local density or the current density of electrons. But when all of this, when we rewind the wheels back, okay, when we take expansion backwards, it becomes contraction. And so this density becomes more and more dense. The density of electrons become more and more dense as time goes backwards. So in fact, when we scroll back time enough to this early time in the universe, our photons are going to scatter efficiently many, many times. Okay, so expansion works by actually saying that this product, I, have, I actually need to, con to change, and the correct result is a time integral from some early time, let's call it zero for now, until t universe, okay, of the differential optical depth. So what I have here is C sigma Thomson times Ne, but now Ne is a function of time, and for homogeneous expansion, this Ne contracts and expands like the cube of the linear scale. Okay, so this Ne becomes more and more, becomes larger as time goes towards the origin, and it beats this measure and gives us a large optical depth. But we will do this in detail. Okay. So CMBR, the fact that it's a black body, is also strong evidence in support of expansion. So this I'll essentially skip. Um, but I'll devote an entire session for it, which is um, the light element abundance. 
So we can extrapolate the expansion even further back um, to the past. And from the physics of this early, very um, hot and dense plasma, so it's dense because, um, as you can see, expansion condenses uh, the particles, um, we can actually calculate another property, which is the light element abundance, with great success observationally. Okay, but we will discuss this in a dedicated session. Okay. So I have about half an hour more. Giovanni, 20 minutes? Half an hour, great. Okay, so this was my intro. Okay, um, and I hope now we can get quantitative and work out some of the implications of this homogeneity, isotropicity, and expansion. And my hopes for today is to do the following. So to understand physics of the early universe, or really what's interesting for us, particle physics of the very early universe, we are really interested in this early time when everything was hot and dense. To get to this early time correctly, we have to backtrack the locally seen uh, expansion back to very early times. And to do this, we will have to understand the dynamics of expansion. And before that, we'll have to understand some of the implications of kinematics, particle kinematics of expansion. And the first thing I want to do is sort of put this concept of redshift on a firm ground and discuss the energy of the photons as we are contracting the space around them when we scroll back time. Okay? So I want to start with implications of this expansion, just kinematical implications, and then to work out the law of expansion, physical law of expansion for this gas of galaxies. So let me reset. Okay, so we saw that um, for us, seeing all the galaxies recede from us, um, there is the redshift effect, which we understood just as a Doppler effect. The fact that the galaxy, is, the emitter, is escaping from us at some finite velocity, it produces a relativistic Doppler effect that redshifts the light of the photon. Um, but we want to put this together with general relativity. And furthermore, I want to do it without mentioning general relativity in this session. So we'll just do it from the kinematics, from the fact that we see this gas of galaxies uniformly escaping from us. That's enough to understand what's going on. We will assume homogeneity and isotropicity, so we will assume really that this evidence is true and that on large scales, this recession is really homogeneous and isotropically expanding from us. And when the universe in this uniform limit, so you should imagine this, of, this gas of particles to be really uniform, okay? When this recession, this expansion, is universal properties of, of this gas of galaxies, then it becomes clear that even though this map of the galaxies is constantly changing, what do I mean by that? I mean that as we speak, these galaxies are receding from us, so, in fact, we have to draw the map again and again and again. At the end of the lecture, these galaxies have moved. Those that are far away have moved a, f a few thousand kilometers from where they were when this picture was taken. Okay? So, we will have to draw the map again, in principle. And the map will really change. The physical locations of the galaxies will change. They are moving. But we don't want to, r to draw the map again and again and again. We'd like to factor out this expansion from this map, because it's clear conceptually to you that once you've seen this map once, you don't have to draw it again. If you know the law of expansion, all you have to do is to take the map that you drew before and expand it once you know this law. So for this, we'll use what is called co-moving coordinates. And by co-moving coordinates, I just mean, okay, here is the map. We take a snapshot in time. That's how the universe looks like in this slice in time, okay? And this is our map, the coordinates. We put coordinates on this map. We give names to these galaxies, to these points, so we know where to find them. 
and then we let it continue to expand. So the physical location of some galaxy in this gas is a function of time as we see. We'd like to mod out this function of time, so we'll call our moving coordinates eta. It's a vector on this map, three-dimensional vector. This real map is three-dimensional. It will be time independent because this eta will just denote the location coordinates on the map at a snapshot in time, at some fixed time, times some function of t that denotes our uniform expansion. Now we don't have to draw the map again and again. We just have to understand this function a of t. And all the content of our map is in this new moving coordinate eta. So, and now, these galaxies are sending light for us, for, um, to us. Here you can see them, you can see them in light. Okay, so these galaxies are sending light rays to us. And we would like to characterize the motion, trajectory of these light rays as they come to us, okay, in this expanding background. And this motion of the light rays is most easily characterized in terms of the commoving coordinates. Because the event of emission and event of detection of the light rays can just be understood as, let's say, the galaxy here emitted, we consider the event when a galaxy here emitted a photon, and we will consider that the trajectory is complete on the event that this photon is detected by us. Okay, so these events correspond to commoving points. And even though when the galaxy here emitted a photon, obviously it will propagate to us, and as it propagates, the galaxy is expanding because the map is ever-changing. That is true, okay? So the physical position of this galaxy is, mo is changing. Physical position of the galaxy is changing at the same time as the photon is making its way to us. To us. However, its commoving coordinate is fixed because it's just a snapshot of the map. This is why it's so easy to understand this causal structure or propagation of light on this commoving map. So in some instant of time dt, we would like to know what is the physical distance that our photon has, can make from its emission point. Well, in time interval dt, the physical distance, the x physical, locally around this time interval is just a of t d eta. Okay, so now we can relate. We're looking at a small differential in commoving coordinates or in time, so that if this function a is a smooth function, and it will be, we can mod it out. We can look at it at a given time slice around the little interval. And now we have a relation between d eta and the x, okay? or between the eta and universe time. And the relation is that our commoving coordinate interval is c dt over a of t. <coughs> so now let's understand the path of a light emitted from a, from a source. So let's consider an emitter that sends pulses, a train of light pulses, okay, to a receiver. And our emitter will sit on some galaxies, and this will be our receiver, it will be us, okay? So it sends a pulse, sends pulse at time, let's say, t1. And then again, it's time t1 plus delta t1, and so on and so forth. It sends the trains of pulses. These pulses are propagating, propagating on our grid until they get to us. So these pulses are detected. by receiver, at time t2 and t2 plus 
delta T2. Okay? <coughs> so these pulses are being emitted, they are propagated to the receiver, and then they are detected. And they are emitted with time interval of delta T1. Propagate to the receiver and are detected with time interval of delta T2 on this expanding background. Okay? Now we can calculate the coordinate distance or the co moving distance that each of these pulses are doing on our grid. Okay? So the distance, coordinate distance between the emitter and the receiver, we know how to compute it. It's an integral of our d eta along the motion of the photon. So it's an integral on this. The first pulse goes from T1 to T2. And makes this coordinate distance on the, on the way. And the second pulse goes from T1 plus delta T1 to T2 plus delta T2. on our coordinate grid. But the two pulses are just going between us and some co-moving observer, OK? But the coordinate distance, the co-moving distance between the meter and us is fixed. It's just a name. It's a snapshot. It's the distance at some given time. Therefore, this coordinate distance is the same for the two photons, OK? They're just going from source A to B, and they're doing it again and again. This is all you need to understand redshift with just a bit of algebra. So for instance, so this, I would say, eta is constant by our definition of it, OK? So this integral I can split as an integral from t1 plus delta t1 to t2, plus the integral from t2 to T2 plus delta T2, yes? And then if I pass this part of the integral to the left, I have an equality. So this part, integral from T1 to T2 minus this integral, has to be equal to that one. So therefore, integral from T1, T1 plus delta T1, is equal to the same thing for T2. Okay? And this is an exact relation. It holds in general relativity. All we did is to discuss the motion of these uh, particles on our map. And it has a differential version, which is imagine that we take this uh, little interval between the emitted pulses to be very small, OK? So in that case, <clears throat> at the receiver point, really space time has no time to expand between the little pulses. All the expansion happens during the propagation. And that is the differential version. And it says that delta T1 over A of T1 is equal to delta T2 over A of T2, OK? However, consider our pulse strain. So our pulse strain was this. This is really the same. And actually, this way of thinking about light <coughs> is always useful when we think about the effect of gravity. So for instance, gravity waves or metric perturbations. You can always, it's often convenient to think in terms of little short pulses. And these just map directly to a continuous wave. So our little delta t here maps to wavelength, lambda, which I can write as saying <coughs> that lambda at the emitter over the scale t at the emitter 
is equal to lambda at the receiver over the function a at the time that the receiver is receiving the light. <clears throat> and now it's convenient since it is almost always, and in my lectures it will always be the case that we are the receiver. We are looking at light coming from different ob uh, objects. It's convenient to take a of t naught to be one, where t naught is now. Okay. So therefore, our co-moving map is a snapshot now of the universe today. This is just a choice. Clearly, the choice of A at the time we make the snapshot is correlated with the scale we choose for our coordinate um, distances. Okay. So this is just a convenient choice, and then it fixes, by the physical distances today, it fixes the scale for our map. Just the scale label on our map of galaxies. Okay. So we will set T observer to be T naught and A of T naught to one. And so what we have is that lambda observed over lambda emit is one over A at the time that the photon was emitted. And then it's convenient to define this A as one plus Z. This is just a definition, okay? So if I have my expansion law has some function for expansion A of T that I wrote, it will map to Z of T just this way. And when you take this definition, then delta lambda over lambda, which is lambda observed minus lambda emit, over lambda emit is z. So this is cosmological redshift for you. This formula is more general than the special relativistic Doppler effect that we considered before when we interpreted the map. And the reason is that this formula can happily account for acceleration in this expansion. We don't need to go with a constant velocity. Constant velocity for these galaxies per distance is actually <clears throat> only a property of the very, very local universe. In fact, we can have an arbitrary function A here that can increase and then decelerate, accelerate, etc. And our formula there will be correct. It was just the, project, the trajectories of photons on our grid. Okay, so this is the full general relativistic formula, in fact. Questions to here? <clears throat> this is all very simple, I guess. So we understand cosmological redshift as the first implication of expansion. Light is redshifted. Delta lambda over lambda is z. And when you think about these photons, this has another implication. Okay, so now the wavelength of the photon, if you track this formula, the wavelength of the photon from the point that it was emitted, so I can write it as a function of time, the wavelength of the photon as observed by somebody seeing it after some time t, it's the redshift of the emitted time times one plus z t. Okay, or if we consider it today, of course, then lambda at t naught is lambda at the emission times one plus z. So if the wavelength of the photon is being stretched by the factor of one plus z as we see it, this means that the frequency of the photon
is the frequency at emission over 1 plus z, because this frequency is just c over lambda. But the energy of the photon, do it here. Energy of the photon is, of course, proportional to its frequency. So the energy of the photon is being redshifted. So the energy of the photon is redshifted. It's proportional to 1 over 1 plus z. OK, so from a mission, as time passes in this universal expansion, the energy of the photons as seen by a later time observer decreases. <clears throat> it becomes smaller and smaller. We could scroll the time, we could scroll it over, um, or backwards if you want. We could say that the energy, of course, the energy of the photon when it was emitted is one plus z times the energy of the photon observed today. Okay, so a photon we see at a given energy is were emitted at an energy that is larger by one plus z, which is why this hot Big Bang is hot. Actually, won't discuss of galaxy. Okay, this hot Big Bang is hot because when we scroll expansion backwards, when we make the scale factor smaller and smaller, We make the scale factor smaller and smaller. We scroll expansion backwards. Redshift grows. Energy of the photons we see today has been a factor of z higher than it is as we see today. The universe is hotter. The photons are more energetic. And in fact, the temperature, this you can easily convince yourself, the temperature of the photons at time z will be 1 plus z times the temperature of the photons Let's call it T naught, the temperature of the photons that we see today. Okay, so photon energy, redshift. And if these photons are just freely expanding and we saw that they are, then it just means that the temperature of this gas of photons also redshift. So, so far for the kinematics of this expansion. So now we see that the scale factor is really very important because the soup of galaxies that we are seeing is swimming inside a bath of photons. And these photons are becoming more and more energetic when we scroll time backwards. And it becomes very interesting to understand how this expansion works. How is really the law what sets the behavior of this function A? Do it here. So we want to know the dynamics of this function A of T. Okay. This exercise I will have to complete next time, but I will start to set it up now. Okay? We want to understand how can we extrapolate backwards or forward the motion of this gas of galaxies. And to understand these dynamics, again, we're going to just take the homogeneous and isotropic expanding picture. We will try to understand the dynamics of the simplest case, which is really that this is a snapshot of a truly homogeneous and isotropic gas of galaxies. Extending to infinity in all directions. Okay. <clears throat> and it's convenient for this analysis, we want to know where these galaxies are going. Are they going to come back? Are they going to expand forever? And with what velocity? It's convenient to pick an origin to this picture, to put a coordinate basis on this picture. And 
to consider what's going on inside some region that respects most of the symmetries of this problem. So some spherical region of radius r. Okay. And we're going to try to understand the dynamics of this gas of galaxies under homogeneity and isotropy, we will try to understand it with Newtonian mechanics. And the first problem we encounter when we want to understand this expansion is that the system that we have is in fact, again, as I said, seems to be infinite. We have an infinite uniform distribution of these galaxies. And in fact, when Newton tried to understand how this um, gas of stars is going to behave, he also thought, what he thought was the gas of, ga of stars was actually just our galaxies, which we know today is very non-uniform. But he thought maybe it was a uniform gas of stars. And he tried to understand how this gas of stars behaves with the Newtonian physics that he, that he, he had. And in fact, his conclusion was, that an infinite gas of stars, uniform and isotropic, <coughs> uniform gas of stars, will have a static solution. In other words, he thought that every little mass element in this gas of stars will feel contradicting pulls, contradicting gravitational force from the rest of this uniform universe, and he thought the solution was was, would be static. He was completely wrong. In fact, Newton's equations have no static solution for this infinite uniform configuration of, of stars. Okay, so the fact that this gas extends to infinity is already a hurdle for us when we try to understand it. We will hit again why it's, it's difficult in a minute. Nevertheless, we can work it out. So we're going to make a little cheat from GR, from, special, from general relativity, to actually put us on firm grounds in terms of Newtonian physics. And what we're going to point out is that as long as we consider the dynamics inside a spherical shell, and the rest of the matter is a, is a uniform distribution of matter outside of this spherical shell, then we have a theorem, Birkhoff's theorem, and Birkhoff's theorem tells us in simple words simply that the matter outside R doesn't matter. Meaning that, in fact, if you have a spherical configuration, you put a shell like this, all of the uniform matter outside of the shell has no um, net gravitational force acting on anything inside of this, of this sphere. Okay? So we have a theorem at, that we will not prove at our disposal that tells us that we can basically ignore the rest of the world outside of R. What we can't ignore, we can't ignore the effect of the particles inside of R on each other, okay? This we have to take care of. And actually, we have a reason to be optimistic, so I won't pursue it, this dynamics now. What we want to understand, due to Birkhoff's theorem, is how this uniform ball of galaxies behaves, okay? We have some little cause to be optimistic that our equations that we'll derive with Newtonian physics in this little ball of gas will actually maybe apply to GR if we are careful enough. And the reason is that literally, strictly speaking, in the uniform distribution case, it is clear that we could derive these equations for different values of this size R, different values of the ball, okay? So in particular, we could apply our equations to a very small little ball of galaxies in this uniform gas. And when we consider very local regions in space-time, then there is an equivalence principle, a defining concept in GR that tells us that on very, very small scale regions, GR is actually unimportant, and space-time is locally flat. And more precisely here, space-time is ne never really completely locally flat, or not, in principle it doesn't need to be, but the limit of the equivalence principle in this case says that in a small enough region, we should be able to describe everything with Newtonian physics. 
as a result of that, our Newtonian exercise is actually not futile. It will give us the correct uh, equations uh, once we go through it next time. Okay, so that's it for today.